Hey, how you doing, man? Very good. So what you been good. up to? Oh, just you know, working and recording the new album and uh just man, you are punctual. My god, it is straight up eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah. God, how you been? I've been good, good, good. You're not in Nam this year? Cooperating oh, yeah. in that. Yeah, I'm going I'm going to Nam. When are you going? I'll be I'm going Saturday and maybe Sunday, but for sure Saturday. Greg Leon, what you've been up to in this um, sunny weather of California, I'm sure you've been working hard. I've been working really hard on the new record and uh, got a couple of band member changes, some uh, some new guys, and uh, hoping these are the right guys. And uh, Just been working on the new record. I'm finishing up the last song, and uh, the name of the album is Tell the Children. And uh, it's uh, I think it's probably the heaviest record I've done so far. The four records, this will be the heaviest. Any uh, change in amps? guitars tones you're using in this one or well i make you know i i i'm really into electronics and i i work on a lot of amps and stuff and i make some pedals there's some uh stuff that i've made and modified in here the amps that i'm uh i'm running right now i uh completely rewired and uh i'm running uh you know groove tube speaker emulator so i can go straight into the uh the console and then straight into the uh actually i go straight into my tape machine i still record tape i got a a two-inch 24-track studio, and I just love the sound of it. You don't get them too often uh, these days. Probably hard to no, find. No, not these days, but everybody that hears this stuff, they freak out and say, man, this is the fattest sounding record. And It's true, man. I do a lot of sessions for other people, and it's always in Pro Tools or you know one of these other uh, digital things, and it just always sounds small. And I'm using the exact same equipment when I go in, but when they play it back, I just go, man, thank God I kept all my tape stuff and all my tube mic pre's and all my good tube mics and all the stuff I've been collecting since I was a kid, and you know, I got uh, I got quite a studio now. So the 24 track tape recorders you got here are are the reel to reels, the older ones. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a uh, 24 track two inch machine. So you can't yeah. buy them anymore. Oh no, I haven't made these for years. You. Uh, wow. There's uh, there's kind of a demand starting to come back because people that are really into audio realize that tape is the way to go. It just nothing sounds like tape or feels like tape. Uh, when you uh, you play, do the playbacks. I mean, there's a lot of times I, I do the playbacks. It's not like the drummer's playing right there in the room with me. The cymbal sounds so real, and the bass is so deep, and the thud, and it just always cracks me up. It always makes me feel proud to, uh, you know, that it, that I'm capturing this on tape the way that I am. When you play live, do you uh, mic your amps also with the board? Mix? Yeah, yeah, I I do mic the amps live, and I use uh, sure 57 microphones for the uh, for the live sound. So you're playing in stereo most likely. Absolutely, yeah. Stereo and, chorus separating out. And also you're you're lined out through the mixing board. Right, exactly. So you get a very thick sound going on. Yeah. Now I read you've uh, replaced Randy Rhodes in Quiet Riot. Right. Yeah, I did. Uh, I played with uh, Kevin for about a year. It was the uh, Kevin Dubrow and Drew Forsythe, and uh, a guy that actually I brought along with me from one of my old band, Sweet Nineteen, a guy named Gary. Uh, Van Dyke and uh, Randy had called me up and Kevin called me up and uh, Randy's told me that he got the gig with Ozzy and that he was I was his first pick for the uh, replacement and uh, I would, couldn't have been happy I mean I loved Quiet Riot and I was at the shows and we used to do shows all the time and you know, Randy and I were hanging out anyways and out, we rehearsed at the same place they did so uh, you know it just seemed kind of like a natural thing I knew most of the music anyways from just hanging out with him and going to the shows for so long. So you've been friends with Randy Rhodes, basically, and working at the Institute, where his mother Yeah, teaches. yeah, I, I was friends with Randy. I saw Randy uh, open up for Van Halen at the Glendale, uh, Glendale College back in about 77, 76 or 77, and uh, I became fans of Van Halen and uh, Quiet Riot at that point. I was the front row center. I went with my drummer, who was the head of custodians at the time, and... Uh, he put some reserve seats on the front, and uh, I hadn't seen either one of these bands, and uh, it was definitely life-changing to see both those bands. I went backstage and met Randy and uh, met uh, uh, Kevin, and I met all the guys from Van Halen by accident. I went back looking for Randy, and I wound up in Van Halen dressing room, and they were just getting ready to go on. They were very cool. I mean, I've, I've hung out with them many times since then, but uh, yeah, that was my first meeting with Randy, and he was always just the best, absolutely the best. And after that, he, uh, he found you a job? for uh, working as a guitar teacher, most likely? Yeah, yeah, he had a, uh, his mother owns and still owns to this day, his mother, uh, Dolores, owns a music studio, a music school in uh, in the valley here, and uh, it's called Musonia, and 
when he went, he needed somebody to take his place, you know, to teach the kids because they didn't want to lose all the. I had about 85 students that I just I went from teaching no one to teaching 85 people in like a slam of a week. I mean, it was just slamming on me, and uh, it was uh, it was that was life changing. Wow. You know, you were hurt, you uh, teaching all day, then you're rehearsing all night and playing shows on the weekend. So it was just nothing but guitar that whole time. Any uh, students that made it big that you taught? Um, yeah, I keep running into people, and people, you know, email me on stuff on like MySpace and stuff. But I, nobody I can think of out of the top of my head right now. There was a lot of people though. But uh, one of the guys, he, he's actually really big right now, is a guy named Peter Magolis, and he's a, a big time director now. He works for Dakota Films, and he also does a lot of television shows, and movies. But he's actually went pretty far with the music. But then he quit, and now he's a uh, a director, and he's actually the guy that's doing the new Randy Rhodes movie. He's the director of it and uh, producer of it and for Dakota Film. And you taught Peter Margolis. Well, just for a little while. It was mostly Randy, but uh, God, there were so many kids there, so many people that were taking lessons. It was it was crazy. I mean, 85 students a week, that's a lot of people to spend between a half hour and an hour with each. Yeah. They have different needs and different wants and stuff. You never What's taught that? Joe Holmes? Oh, no, Which, no, I know Joe. I haven't seen him for a long time. In fact, I bought some equipment off him. No, I I, uh, I don't know him that well. I've met him, but I don't know him that well. And at this time when you're teaching, you're playing in Dawkins at the same time? No, I was still playing with uh, Randy, with Kevin Dubrow at the time. With uh, We changed the name to Doc, uh, to, uh, we changed the name to Dubrow at the time, and we were playing out onto that until we got a record deal. But I could see that a record deal wasn't going to come, or at least I thought there wasn't going to be one from what all the producers were telling me and the record labels. He told me to uh, to move on, you know, because nobody was going to touch Kevin, because mm -hmm. he had a pretty bad uh, reputation at the time as being hard to work with. So I left, to join Dokken, and uh, when that gig came to me, man, I was ready to go because Don promised that we'd be in Europe in a month, and sure enough, we were. Ever get to see uh, Ozzy Osbourne with Randy Rhodes live? Oh yeah, I saw him quite a few times live. Actually, Randy always gave me tickets when they were in town. In fact, one time I went down with his mom, uh, and we sat together and. Uh, it was just great. I mean, I was so proud of Randy because everybody knew that Randy was going to do it. I mean, it was just a matter of time. He just had that thing that you just loved him when you met him and when he was on stage. He had the, you couldn't take your eyes off the guy. He just had the stage presence. What do you remember of the gigs when you seen Randy? Like, the volume was immense loud? Um, it, it, he definitely was a loud guitar. He had a really unorthodox uh, setup at the time. He had a... Uh, uh, a 412 Ampeg cabinet with uh, Altec speakers in it, which no but no guitar player in his right mind would use. But he used that, and he had a solid state PV head that he used that was loud as hell. And he used a a, a super distortion guitar effect made by MXR, yeah. and then his Les Paul, and uh, it was so directional with those uh, speakers in there. If you stood in front of it, you'd you just pull the hair right off your head. I mean, it was just so damn loud. But if he went a few feet over, it was okay. It wasn't that, you know, blistering. It's funny because I pulled Randy aside. I said, you cannot possibly think that Ozzy's going to let you use this equipment. And he goes, well, I'm scared of losing my sound. And I started laughing. I go, Randy, you don't even have a sound. Your sound is in your super distortion pedal. I go, why don't you let me lend you my equipment? So I lent him my Marshalls and stuff, and uh, he fell in love with them at that. And then I guess Ozzy got him the deal with, uh, with Marshall, and they did the amp for him. And... He told me, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, he told me that the amp that they gave him, they let him test out a bunch of ones, but supposedly it was the, they what they at the factory called the the uh, Jimi Hendrix mod, whatever really? the heck that was. I never got inside of his amps to look at them or anything, but uh, supposedly he said that was the one that he chose, the one that got him closest to the sound he heard in his head was uh, that amp, so they made him some of those, and that's what he took out on the road with him. Like the, the 1959 model? Yeah. Something like that? That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. I never played through his amps, though, once he got with Ozzy. He was always so busy. I mean, I'd be, uh, you know, teaching at the school and stuff, and whenever he was in town, he'd always stop in and say hi and hang out. You know, we'd have a, uh, you know, a Coke or a coffee together or something, and uh, we'd always hang out at night and stuff like that. But he was so busy. Man, when he got in that band, he didn't have any time for anything but Ozzy. I mean, it was it was unbelievable how, how, uh, how tight, tight his time was. When did you join Dawkin exactly, the time period? I believe it was 1981, I think. It was 81 or 80. No, you know what? It was 80, because that was the year that, uh, that uh, what's his name, passed away. Uh, John Lennon passed away. Because I remember we were over in Europe, and the, it was the weirdest thing. The night before uh, he got assassinated, I, uh, 
I had this weird feeling come over me that I was thinking about all the famous bands and every one of them had somebody that died and I started naming like the Doors. I, I'm talking, uh, you know, the Stones, uh, Hendrix, uh, Janis Joplin, all of these people. I just kept naming. I go, isn't it weird that as big as uh, the Beatles got that nobody ever died in the Beatles? That You know, nothing funny happened. And I just had this weird, I, man, I got a weird feeling about the Beatles. And the next morning, the newspaper read John Lennon shot dead in New York. And this was, I was in, in Germany when, when I saw this. I couldn't believe it. And the guys looked at me and said, dude, if you ever have a weird feeling about me, please do not tell me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very surreal. That whole day was just like a dream. And people were out in the streets over in Germany. And, oh, it was just terrible. Just so, terrible. So this is before you joined Quiet Riot. No, this is, this is after. Actually, we joined Quiet Riot, but we changed the name to Dubro yeah. until we got a deal. Because, uh, you know, Kevin and Randy... Kevin wanted to, you know, uh, use the name if there was a deal because he always dreamed that Randy would come back and they would carry on with Quiet Riot. That was Kevin's dream. And you were in Dawkins before Quiet Riot in '79. Oh no, no, no! I was in Dawkins after after that. Oh, I thought you recorded the '79 EP of Dawkins. Uh, I did. I recorded that over in Europe with uh, with Dieter Dirks produced that, and uh, that's actually the the recording that got them their record deal. What would that date be? Oh God, I don't know. I don't know. It was uh, over in. It must have been 1980 if if I recorded with Dokken over there. I mean, when I recorded with Dokken over there, because that was the year that John Lennon died. That's how I always preference it, because okay. uh, there's so many things that happened. But I know where I was when John Lennon died, and I was in Germany, in Hamburg, Germany, with on tour with Dokken, hmm. and that's when we did the recordings there. We took a couple days off and went into the studio with Dieter Dirks from the Scorpions and uh, laid down about eight or ten tunes, and that was the tunes that. Uh, Don shopped and actually got a record deal with Carrera Records at the time, and then it turned into the deal with Electra. You know, on Wikipedia, it states that you're you're in Dokken from '77 to '79. Is that true? No, it would, it would probably be '79 uh, and '80. '79, '80. I I haven't even read that Wikipedia thing. Is that what it says? Uh, I don't know how this stuff gets out there, but uh, yeah, it was definitely '80. Definitely '80. '79, '80. Then. I uh, no, it had to be later than that. Really? Okay, that could Definitely be Definitely later than that, yeah. That was like 82 or 83. You played also with Tommy Lee. Was that a good lineup? Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, I had a, another drummer at the time who I'm still great friends with, a guy named Gary Hallinan, who who goes by his professional name is Gary Holland, and he was in Great White, and he was in Dawkin with me, too. He was, he was the original Sweet 19 drummer, and uh, we had a little falling out for a little while, and uh, Tommy Lee used to follow my band around. And he was, every gig, he was like, dude, 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 I want to play with your band. Dude, I want to play with your band. I love what you do. And I, I know every one of your songs. I've been to every gig. And he was like this 17-year-old kid, so I didn't really take him serious. And uh, this kept going on and going on. And finally, you know, Gary and I took a break, and uh, I, I still wanted to go on with the band. And I went to this club called The Wood Sound, and I ran into uh, Tommy Lee. And he's, uh, he's you know, dude, 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 we got, you know, he's going on. And, uh. I said, you know what? What are you doing tomorrow? And he goes, I'm playing with you. I go, good. What's your address? And <laughs> he go, no. He goes, uh, I'm playing with you. And he goes, I got a studio. All you got to do is show up, and we can play all day and all night. And he goes, and I got a bass player too. So, I had a bass player, John Kemp, from his old band, and we got together and we played together. A, I don't know, a year or two, and played all over the, you know, the Starwood and the, the Whiskey and all these shows. And Tommy was great. It, Tommy was absolutely great. He was as good then as he is right now. And uh, even at 17, I could not believe the talent this guy had. And he's a natural. You going to be playing uh, any uh, tours in the near future? Or are you just going to be playing well, California? Uh, I just, yeah, I just signed a deal with a label called F and A Records out of Nashville, Tennessee, and they are trying to put together a tour right now to uh, to get me back out there. We uh, we went out last year. We went to the East Coast and played a bunch of, of dates out in Maine, and uh, now we're trying to uh, we're going to probably be going out. I'm hoping in the spring or the summer, but uh, definitely the spring. And we're talking to, uh, I guess the label's talking to an agency, and they're trying to get us to Japan because I know in Japan there's a huge Greg Leon invasion following because I get so many emails from them and so many. I even get, uh, like the last 20 years, I get Christmas cards from the fans over there, and uh, it's just amazing. I mean, they just love, you know, what I do and stuff. So I, I hope that we can get that together and, go over there. It's not like I don't want to go over there. I'd love to go over there. Could that be some sort of connection with Quiet Riot since they had that big Japan following? 
Yeah, I'm sure there is. That definitely adds to the Greg Leon Invasion curiosity, the, the Dawkins Association, the Quiet Riot Association, and the Randy Association. Yeah. Um, yeah, that definitely, I'm sure that's going to play into it. That's what the label is hoping in, anyways, because uh, th- I should be out there playing. I mean, Alan was one of the guys that started this whole thing. I shouldn't be, uh, you know, not playing. What do you see in the near future? You're going to be releasing that new album and shopping it online and... Uh... I've already got distribution for the new album through my new record label, FNA Records. Okay. And so people can go to fnaRecords.net and uh, they can find the albums there. There's the other three albums are already there for sale, and then there'll be the new one when it comes out. And I think after the new one comes out, they're going to offer a box set, at, and you get all four CDs and you get a discount price on it. And that way, everybody has everything that I've done, you know, as far as the invasion goes. So what are you going to be doing at NAM this year? Oh, I've just talked to, uh, you know, the vendors and stuff and talked to uh, product reps and stuff like that. And, you know, I've run into a lot of people that have followed me for years, too. And i got a lot of friends that, uh, uh, you know, I don't see, but maybe once a year, once every other year or something that uh, either people that I played with in former bands or people that own businesses that I've dealt with. And it's just a good meeting place where you can go and uh, hang out and run into people and, uh you know, people come up and they want to get the picture taken with you and stuff, or mm-hmm. or they just want to ask you questions. You know, they want to know how do you get that sound, or what effect we're using on this song, or whatever, or what was it like to know Randy Rhodes? I mean, that's the one, another one I get. You know, Randy Rhodes, the uh, Jackson just unveiled the Concord guitar, the white one that they're re-releasing, uh-huh. 60 editions. I think oh, they wow. just unveiled that at NAM. I've seen a YouTube video before calling you. Wow, great! For twelve thousand dollars each. Oh my God! Yeah. You know, I uh, I actually was the guy that took Randy out to uh, meet Grover Jackson out at Charvel when he had the original Randy Rhodes uh, Flying V made, and because uh, he did, I had an endorsement deal with him, and uh, I wanted to help Randy out, and uh, so we he took him and I went out there, and he took the little plans that he had written down on a big piece of paper, full size guitar that he drew out, and uh, the three of us just whittled it down and came up with the rough of it, and then Jack and uh, Grover ended up, uh, you know, finishing the thing off and presenting it to him, and he loved it. So that, that's uh, another little piece of history there. The Concord? No, no, the Randy Rhodes uh, guitar. I don't know anything about the Concord. It's probably just a reissue of the original one that Charvel did. Okay. You're... Jack, they, they changed the name to Charvel at that point. Well, Greg, it was a pleasure talking to you. It's a pleasure talking to you, too.